We'll now talk about early development, and I'll use a couple of examples in this lecture as we go along. Uh, one will be early development in snails and in nematodes. Basically, if we talk about the general polarity, symmetry, and pattern of the embryo, these are characteristics that have been determined before fertilization. And this was noted in the 1920s by uh, Professor Edwin Grant Conklin, who st said, the general polarity, symmetry, and pattern of the embryo are egg characteristics which were determined before fertilization. And certainly in the ensuing research that's gone on in this field, this has been verified time and again in many different species. Indeed, the egg cytoplasm plays a major role in determining the patterns of cleavage, of gastrulation, and cell specialization. It does so by interacting with the nuclear genome established at fertilization, but the initial development, the first cleavages, and up probably to the point of gastrulation in many of the organisms, are under the control that was placed in the cytoplasm by the mother uh, during the development of that egg. Of course, during cleavage, rapid cell divisions divide the cytoplasm of the fertilized egg into numerous cells, and these cells undergo dramatic displacements during gastrulation. During cleavage and gastrulation, the axes of the embryo are also determined, and the embryonic cells begin to acquire their respective fates. There are three body axes that form and that we must be concerned about. Of course, the anterior posterior head tail axis, the dorsal ventral, which is the back belly axis, and the left right axis. Different species specify these axes at different times, but cleavage always precedes gastrulation. However, in some species, axis formation begins as early as the oocyte formation. It begins while it's an immature oocyte. And it can be completed during cleavage in some organisms or extend all the way through gastrulation as in Xenopus. The developmental patterns among metazoa basically involve the classification of organisms depending on their development. A eukaryotic organism means that cell in that organism contains a nucleus and several distinct chromosomes that undergo mitosis. A multicellular eukaryotic organism, could be a plant, a fungus, or an animal, means that the cells formed by mitosis remain together as a functional unit. To be a metazoan, however, by definition, that means that organism is an animal. It's an animal if it's a metazoan. If it's a metazoan, it's an animal. All animals that gastrulate are metazoans, and all metazoans gastrulate. So all animals gastrulate is what it turns out to be. And if you think about it, there are some 35 metazoan phyla. So there are a large number of uh, different ways that animals can gastrulate. If we look at the first slide, we can see that there is a division of the various kinds of metazoans, the various animals, and we should just take a few minutes to quickly go through this rather simple rendition of the tree of life. You can see that there are four broad divisions of the animals as defined by their developmental patterns. The developmentally unique sponges are at the top, the diploblastic animals, the protostomes, and the deuterostomes. If we look at the sponges and tenophores and cnidarians, we see that they are non-bilaterally symmetrical. They are nonetheless animals, and they have various traits in common with some of the higher forms of animals. It's really, like I said, evolutionary relationships that have put these animals in the categories that you see them here, and DNA evidence has really verified that. Sponges, for a time, were controversial as to whether they were really animals or they were parazoans, in other words, whether they were metazoans or animals or parazoans, but it's been uh, clearly shown now that they indeed belong in the animal family by our systematic zoology colleagues, and that uh, those taxonomists who are expert in this field have come up with this, and now the DNA evidence is, has made this very clear. Sponges do have three types of cells, but interestingly, 
They don't have mesoderm. So they have no true organ systems, no digestive tube, no circulatory system as we think of a circulatory system, no nerves to speak of or muscles, although they do pass through a gastrulation phase. They also have embryonic and larval stages, and in that sense they are very much like metazoans. However, in other ways they are very uh, unique among the metazoans. If we look at the radially symmetrical organisms, the tenophores and cnidarians, those are diploblastic animals. Diploblastic means they have two germ layers. They don't have the three germ layers that, that we've talked about before. They have two germ layers. Those germ layers are the ectoderm and the endoderm. And although they form structures that you might think of as coming from mesoderm, these structures have different origins than mesoderm. And the jellyfish, for example, the cnidarians, uh, have contractile units that will allow those tentacles to, and, and the pulsations to allow them to swim, but nevertheless it's a different mechanism for contraction than what we see in the muscle of vertebrates. As we continue forward and down the list, there are triploblastic animals, and those are sort of the conventional animals we think of as animals. There are the flatworms, which are the protostomes. There's a protostome group starting with the flatworms, mollusks, annelids, and also there are nematodes and arthropods that go into that protostome group. And what protostome means, basically, is mouth first. And so it's embryologically they were classified on the basis of embryological development, where the mouth forms first, mollusks, arthropods, the worm phyla, and the body cavity then forms from hollowing out of a previously solid cord of mesodermal cells. There are two uh, major branches of protostomes, the lophotrochozoans and the ectostozoans. Basically, the lophotrochozoans are those that are free-swimming larvae, and the ectosozoans shed their outer skeletons so they molt. And so the ectosozoans would be things like insects and nematodes. The deuterostomes are the, those that are indicated at the bottom of, of the tree of life here, starting with the echinoderms and going down through the vertebrates. They include the chordates, echinoderms, Certain embryological features show this relationship, even though the starfish wouldn't seem to be that close to maybe the, uh, the vertebrates, the frogs, or for that matter mammals, yet in uh, many ways embryologically they are quite similar. The chordates, the larvae of all of these organisms, have a notochord and pharyngeal arches indicating that they are chordates, and so there's no question about that. And again, molecular analyses that have now been done actually in the late 2000s have really confirmed the relationships of these various animals that are indicated on this chart. If we go to the next slide, one of the things about cleavage is that it happens very, very rapidly. Early in development, cleavage happens rapidly, and part of the reasons it take place so quickly is that all of the information that allows cleavage, or most of the information, that allows cleavage to take place was put there by the mother during the time that egg was being formed. And so as soon as activation takes place from the sperm and the egg begins to develop and a zygote begins to develop, everything is programmed in place to start those early cell divisions. So after fertilization, the egg is, is divided into smaller and smaller units called blastomeres except in mammals, which is under the control of the cytoplasm, perhaps more extensive way than other vertebrates. But like I said, the information was put there in the egg by the mother. The rate of cell division, the placement of early cells, what early cells would be destined to go in certain directions of differentiation. And like I say, it's a, a mitosis takes place very, very rapidly. For example, in the frog, Within 43 hours, there are 37,000 cells, starting from one. 50,000 cells have formed in 12 hours. So that's a mitosis every 10 minutes. So obviously, cell division is taking place very, very quickly. If we look at this short cell cycle, there's a reason for it. Looking at the uh, slide that you have here, you can see that in a cleaving egg, 
what's happening is that you are getting rapid cell divisions because, well, in this case, cyclin, this is an example. If we look at this slide, you see that um, this is how cell division can take place so rapidly in these developing early embryos. What it turns out is that there's no G phase in the cell cycle. It goes directly from mitosis to synthesis of new chromosomal material to mitosis. And so, you know, in the case of Drosophila, you're getting this cycle taking place every 10 minutes in the frog. It's a little bit longer than that, but clearly you're able to have very rapid cell divisions. If you look at the conventional, typical somatic cell, however, which is indicated here on the right, you can see that although mitosis takes place, then there's a big gap, G1 phase, that could last for hours or days or, or even months, depending on the organism that's there before you come to the synthesis component where new DNA is going to be produced and new chromosomes produced, and then to G2, and again, before you get back to mitosis. So mitosis in somatic cells takes a long time because of this G phase. Let's look a little more uh, at what happens during uh, karyokinesis and cytokinesis. If we look at this particular s illustration here, here's a cell that's just beginning to undergo the first division. This, is, uh, an ex this example is a sea urchin embryo. Here you see a diagrammatic representation of the chromosomes which have become hooked up to uh, microtubules that are pulling these chromosomes to the opposite poles. Here are the centrioles that are forming the chromosomes, and these centrioles were contributed by the sperm during fertilization, and so the sperm brought the centrioles in that would give rise to the microtubules uh, via producing tubulin. So this is tubulin material. Uh, and then you also had surrounding the entire ovum a band of actin filaments, microfilaments, although part of that band is in a, an amorphous state, so it's G-actin. But if you look at it then during that first division, you get a karyokinesis, in other words, the chromosomes going to the opposite poles, and then you get a constricting of the microfilaments called the contractile ring, and that will separate the two cells so that cytokinesis takes place. So first you get karyokinesis, then you get cytokinesis. And this is shown here in a confocal micrograph. In this case, it's an echinoendoderm. You can see the nuclei are here. Here are the microtubules. The, the chromosomes have been pulled apart and have started to incorporate and have incorporated into nuclei. The actin is on the outside, indicated in red. This is G-actin, and it will soon start to form into filamentous structures in this area and cause cytokinesis to take place. And here's a more advanced stage. Again, you get microtubules in here. Here are the nuclei in here. Here is a centriole that's spinning out lots of microtubules that can be used then to pull the chromosomes apart. The actin is indicated on the outside. This is G-actin. It's blue in this case, and it has formed filamentous structures here, which have constricted the ovum of that initial zygote that basically will now become two cells. So that's reached the two-cell stage. This zygote has begun to form blastomeres, and it will lead to cleavage in this particular specimen, which happens to be the sea urchin. This is just kind of a summary of what I just mentioned. Uh, karyokinesis involves the mitotic spindle, tubulin. It's in the central part of the cytoplasm. Experimental studies have been done to show which of those proteins are involved in karyokinesis and cytokinesis by knocking out the proteins. Colchicine was the initial drug that was used, and it would depolymerize tubulin and not allow karyokinesis to take place. In other words, the chromosomes would not migrate to the opposite poles. They now use nocodazole, which is a, a similar to colchicine in its activity, but it doesn't affect the membranes the way colchicine does. Uh, cytokinase B is a substance that will basically depolymerize actin microfilaments and form them into G-actin, so they're not able to do the contractile ring. And so if you treat cells with cytokinase B, you will get a large number of multinucleated cells because the cells are not 
able to undergo cytokinesis, they're not able to divide. Let's now take a quick look at the summary of the major cleavage patterns that are present in metazoans, in animals, basically. Here you can see there's holoblastic cleavage, which means the cleavage goes completely through the cells. There are two forms of holoblastic. One is isolethosol. That means there's not very much yolk present, and so the division can be fairly complete. And then there's a mesolethosol, where down here you can see that it will go through uh, in some parts of the cell in the north-south direction. However, when it goes equatorially, there are larger cells below than above because there's more yolk in those cells. That's the vegetal pole of the amphibian egg, and so it does more cleaving on the top in the animal pole than on the bottom, the vegetal pole. In the case of meroblastic cleaving, where there's a significant amount of yolk, such as in mollusks or in fish, reptiles, and birds, you can see that only the surface cells will cleave. There's so much yolk below that it can't cleave at all. And, and if you're, you think about a chicken yolk, how large it is, you can imagine that that first cleavage could in no way go all the way through that yolk to be able to make a division of two cells initially. And so it's done basically on the surface. In the case of the insects, that, and we'll be looking at Drosophila uh, before too long, what happens here is you have a lot of yolk in these eggs as well, and the cells will start to divide along the periphery. And so that's central lecithal division. So just to, to kind of quickly summarize then, we have the isolethosol, uh, where the yolk is fairly sparse. You can get radial cleavage, where all of the blastomeres are the same. They're the same size. Echinoderms, amphioxus. Then there's a, another kind of cleavage that's quite interesting. It's it's spiral cleavage. There's not much yolk there, but the cells are programmed in such a way that they do not evenly distribute the yolk when they divide, number one. And number two, they do not divide at right angles. They divide in a spiral kind of cleavage, and so you end up with what's called spiral cleavage and end up with an animal that's uh, in a spiral form, such as the snail. That's why the snail shell is spiraled. Tunicates have bilateral cleavage, rotational cleavage uh, in all of the mammals, as well as nematodes, interestingly. And then we already mentioned in the amphibian, mesolethosal cleavage, where because of the large amount of yolk in the vegetal hemisphere, you get smaller cells on the top and larger cells on the bottom in that vegetal hemisphere. Meroblastic or incomplete cleavage, again, uh, where the cleavage is taking place really on the surface of the egg and the specialized kind of meroblastic cleavage, incomplete cleavage, found in insects where the egg basically is filled with yolk, and so the cells only form around the periphery of that egg. Certainly after cleavage comes the process of gastrulation. You're familiar with this. We talked a little bit about this before in one of the earlier lectures when we talked about uh, amphibian gastrulation, but uh, you can see that there are different kinds of gastrulation, and if you think about the 35 or so phyla of organisms there are, and all of them have some form of gastrulation or another, you can imagine that there, there is some variation, although there are also uh, a number of similarities in gastrulation and axis formation. So really this proceeds by a combination of cell movements among the various animals, and these cell movements are summarized here in this chart. You have invagination, involution, ingression, delamination, and epiboly. If we look at invagination, such as what you would see in sea urchin eggs, you find that here you have an infolding sheet of cells, and as your book points out here, much like if you poked your finger in a rubber ball or in a balloon, where you would get an invagination, basically, of cells that would move toward the inside of the developing organism. Involution now, although it ends up bringing cells inward into the organism, it's through a different mechanism. There's a, an expanding layer outside that's moving in. The ectoderm or epidermal layer or ectoderm will move inside through the dorsal lip of the blastopore, you may recall. 
uh, and form a layer of mesoderm. Form uh, the endoderm is is in here forming, but you'll form a, an intermediate layer of mesoderm. Ingression. Uh, this is an example where in the sea urchins or in certain of the Drosophilin uh, specialized tissues with respect to the formation of the neuroblasts, the cells will be released from the outside of the organism and they will migrate inwardly into the middle part of the organism and give rise to mesenchymal type structures. In other words, this is a form of mesoderm. So this is mesoderm, just like this is mesoderm, but it's a little different mechanism by which that mesoderm gets inside of the embryo. Delamination, this is hypoblast formation. And again, uh, in this case, you have cells coming in, but they are in parallel sheets, and they will form a whole new sheet of tissue. This will happen in birds and mammals. It will happen, for example, when the neural system is forming and you get a neural plate formed. And finally, epiboly. Again, uh, this is a ectoderm formation in the sea urchins. And what happens here, sea urchins and, and amphibians and tunicates, what happens here is the epidermis on the outside will, uh, the cells will divide and it will continue to grow and it will encase the entire mesoderm and the endoderm uh, that's forming on the inside. And so that's called epiboly. It's where, again, the epidermis or ectoderm moves to surround all of the other layers, in particular the endoderm and the mesoderm and the organs that are forming from those uh, tissue layers in the developing embryo. Now, gas relation then leads also to axis formation. That's a pretty simple concept, but it's one that we need to be aware of. Gas relation defines where the anterior or posterior part of the organism is going to be, where the dorsal or ventral part of the organism is going to be, and you can see that of course, if you look at this fish as an example, the fish will have anterior, posterior, dorsal, ventral, and right left halves or lateral halves. And if we look at a cross section, you can see that this is important because there is polarity then, uh, depending upon which direction you're looking at as you look at the developing organism. I'd like to now talk about a, a couple of um, examples of early development with respect to different kinds of cleavage. We mentioned earlier spiral cleavage in the snail. Well, this is a snail Tomolox trochus, which has an, a rather interesting kind of pattern of cleavage. If you look at the cells, these blastomeres, this is viewing it from the animal pole. In other words, we are looking at the top, looking at it from the dorsal most aspect here. And you can see that what's happening is that the cells, rather than dividing at right angles to one another, are dividing it other than right angle. And the reason that this is so well known, probably, is that the snail is a very good laboratory animal. And I should just take a minute to, to mention some of the things about the snails that, uh, that make them so good. They, uh, they're easy to rear in the lab. They have large eggs. They develop rapidly. They specify cell types readily. In other words, if you remove one of these cells at an early stage, a whole part of that organism will not form because it's specified at this early stage. In other words, it illustrates mosaic development. So losing one of the blastomeres will, like I say, totally eliminate maybe a, a set of muscles that might be in the snail's foot or something like that. But you do have a spiral holoblastic cleavage indicated here. They do not form a blastocele, and the chromere buds off into micromeres. So, in other words, not only do the cells divide at unusual angles, but they divide unequally. And so you can see the division is taking place. If we follow this darker uh, cell here, we can see that the, the cells that come off that, 1A and then one small a, we'll start to form a clone of cells here. These are the second generation over here then. And it will be in a spiral pattern. And so that's why we call it spiral cleavage. And down here, we're looking at the same uh, area, same set of changes during cleavage in this particular animal model. And you can see that it's spiraling. It's beginning to spiral even at this 
early stage. This is probably a little more satisfying to look at if you look at the actual specimens. Here you can see spiral cleavage via confocal microscopy. And up here you can see that the cells are, again, dividing at this rather unusual angle. Here are the chromosomes. These are the spindle fibers, microtubules here. Here's where the centrioles would be. The actin would be around in this area. Here the actin is helping to undergo cytokinesis. Division of the cell, here's a polar body up here that's just coming out. But you can see that the uh, divisions are starting to become at different angles. And when this division takes place, these are scanning electron micrographs now, there's not an equal amount of cytoplasm going into these various cells. Now here's Here's a cell that's the largest cell, and there is indeed one cell that's larger than all the others, and there are different sizes. Uh, here's the polar body up here, polar body, and so you can start to see that the spiral cleavage is taking place in this snail animal model. That's an example then of spiral cleavage. If you look, again, diagrammatically at a couple of different forms there, you can either have left-handed coiling or right-handed coiling, and that is determined at the very first cleavage division. It's genetic. Snails of the same species, generally speaking, will have either left-handed -hand coiling or right-handed coiling, although there are mutations in a species where that could be reversed. But you can see as you look down, at the purple cells that you're starting to get a spiral division which has a different orientation and these snails will end up being mirror images of each other. I'd also like to just quickly go through development in the nematode, Senior Abditis elegans. This has been a very, very popular animal model of, as well because of its unique characteristics, first of all, and also that it has the basic characteristics of higher organisms, yet is a, it is a very, very simple organism. Senior Abditis elegans. And if you look here at these micrographs, you can see that division is taking place. It happened to be scanning electron micrographs. You can see the nuclei here, and here are the uh, blastomeres that are formed. What's interesting about the C. elegans is that it's very popular for similar reasons to why the snail was very popular. It's easy to rear in the laboratory, small, it's free living, it's hermaphroditic, in other words it can produce offspring by itself, it has both male and female organs within its own body. It has a specific finite number of cells, there are 959 somatic cells in senior abditis elegans, and each one of those cells has been traced to a certain component of what that animal will form, and it can be seen through their transparent cuticle, so you, you can trace the what these cells do just by looking through the microscope. They're about a millimeter long, the worms are, and uh, they uh, have a very compact genome. The geno genome has been totally sequenced. Interestingly, there are just about as many genes in senior rhabditis as there are in humans, which is pretty amazing if you think about the complexity of the two organisms. C. elegans has somewhere between 18 and 20,000 genes. Humans have somewhere between 20 and 25,000 genes. Yet, if you look at the number of proteins and the number of nucleotides made, the senior rhabditis only makes about 3% of what humans do with the same number of genes. So obviously uh, there's a different kind of, of mechanism of genetic regulation and so forth that we talked about earlier that doesn't allow senior rhabditis to produce multiple proteins from a single gene. But anyway, it has been a very, very useful organism to study, and I just wanted to mention also as we look at it that there are certain things as development goes on uh, there are 389 cells, for example, that will give rise to these structures here. And that's known after about the fourth division of the cells. And you can see there are 80 cells that form muscle, pharynx, and gonads, 20 that form the intestine, 47 that form muscle and hypodermis, and, and so forth. And so it's a very well-defined animal model, and you can pick out individual cells and
study exactly what those cells do and what genes are, are turned on to produce what proteins and, and so forth. And the final slide in this uh, particular presentation, I just wanted to show you fertilization in early cleavage stages of C. elegans. Here's an adult organism at the top. You can see an A. You can see that there's an ovary there. Now, if we look at B, uh, notice that the the area in the box shows an ovary with some oviducts and eggs that are beginning to mature, and they will go through a spermatheca where sperm is stored. They will get fertilized, and then they will come out through the vulva. Notice if you go posteriorly, you can see another ovary, and so it basically produces ova from both directions and has a two spermatheca and so forth and so it it produces offspring from both directions and the eggs then will start developing and within uh, probably well it's a, within uh, 16 or so days they uh, have gone through the entire process of forming into a, a free I did want to uh, show you very briefly uh, fertilization and early cleavages in C. elegans. Here you can see in panel A an adult organism diagrammatically. There's an ovary. The ovary produces ova, which will come through this area here. They will be fertilized in this spermatheca and then start moving to the vulva area where they will exit the animal. And you can see that there's also a second set of uh, sex organs. There's a ovary and spermatheca in the posterior part of the worm as well. And once these start to develop, there's an anterior posterior uh, direction established in the egg from the very beginning. From the egg onward, these blastomeres are destined to form into certain kinds of structures that will lead to the formation of the adult organism.